thinking that God is not through with you yet. I'm looking for somebody who's not ashamed today to say, had it not been for God on my side, I don't know where I would be right now. But by his goodness, by his mercy, by his grace, I can stand here this morning and say it's not over because God hasn't said to him. I'm looking for some folks just to wave your hands a little bit. I'm looking for some folks that celebration is down in your heart. Father, thank you today. For 44 years is not a short time in our lifetime. But you've been grateful and faithful and you've been merciful. You've been kind for 44 long years. And we say thank you. You didn't have to do it. You did it because of your mercy, your grace, and who you are. Today, then, we give you thanksgiving. We give you praise. We give you honor. We give you glory. Lord, if we didn't thank you today, if we didn't praise you today, the rocks would cry out. But I'm going to cry out on my own and say thank you for where you brought me from. You brought me from a mighty long way. When I look back over my life, and think about where you brought me from. My soul cries out, hallelujah. I thank God for saving me. I thank you for keeping me. Lord, time would not allow us today to enumerate all the things that you've done for us. From Douglas Street to Thornton to Brown Street to J.C. Penney's, we, we couldn't... We just don't have enough time to thank you. And if I had 10,000 tongues, it wouldn't be enough to give you praise. I think about the things that you've done for us, individual blessings, wonderful miracles, healing, comfort, deliverance. What a mighty God you've been. And we say thank you. Now for a few short moments, open our hearts to the word that we'll be looking at today. And whatever is accomplished, we're going to say yes to your will. Thank you for those of us who have gathered today. You kept us from dangers we could see, some we could not. Thank you for folks who might be visitors today. We're glad to have them. And we just celebrate you and place this in your hands. In Jesus' name, we pray and give thanks. Praise God. Praise God. And amen. Go ahead and be seated on this celebration of 44 years of God's faithfulness. I was talking to one of my friends this morning, and we had a good laugh. He said, uh, it's the 44th anniversary. Oh, God bless you. He said, who, who preaching today? I said, Josephus. <laughs> he started laughing. He couldn't stop laughing. I said, uh, we don't have a lot of money, and I ain't paying nobody else. And they said, Bishop Joy, do you believe in free speech? I said, yes. They said, come give one. <laughs> the importance of the church is captured in the words of Jesus in Matthew 16 and 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Well, they reply, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he asked them, who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his holy word. Word of God. Go ahead and be seated. If it's good enough, you can get back up. 
because some Roman Catholics use these verses to substantiate the office and the succession of popes, Protestants have gone to great lengths to reinterpret what seems to be very obvious. And since I'm not reading this text to talk about the small picture but the big picture, I'm going to skip all the debate and announce the obvious. Jesus is still building his church. It is still the church age. And literally the gates of Hades, the powers of death and hell will never conquer Christ's church. I'm just going to stop there because I think somebody ought to just clap your hands or at least celebrate it. Now, you can like it or not. You can agree with it or not. You can join with it or you can work against it. But Jesus' thing is still his church. Yet, but the frailties and the failings of the visible church, which I will not take time to enumerate because that'll be the whole sermon, I like to make a case for why America still needs the church. You may not know this, but the whole American experiment is built upon citizens having some level of morality. It leaves us with a very important question, what is morality? And I'm going to go ahead and define it because I don't think America knows what it is. Morality is the concern with the distinction between good and evil, right and wrong, right or good conduct. It's intimated or hinted at in all of the founding documents. So let me give you one example. The, pre -exam the preamble of the Constitution reads, we the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, to ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. The concept of justice, the general welfare, not only require government, but also individuals that comprise the government to have some concept of morality, some concern for the distinction between good and evil, some the ability to discern right from wrong, some kind of standard for right or good conduct. Today I'm not outlining nor defending the morality of America, but I'm simply going to be pointing out that the foundations of our government are built upon morality, and that morality was taught and supported by the family, the schools, the community, and the church. Please briefly allow me to touch on these institutions. The family is not simply under attack, but the family has lost its way and no longer teaches the Judeo-Christian values and morality that undergirds the founding documents and the way of life that they espouse. It is not simply divorce or the sexual revolution or LGBT plus issues, but the secularization of America has further impacted the family and its viability. LGBT plus issues and perspectives are challenging the very fabric of male and female relationships. Don't worry, I ain't gonna preach about that today. I'll address it in the counterculture club this particular summer. This, is, this sermon is not to delineate the troubles of the American family, but to simply point out the difficulties that we have. The family no longer teaches, the family no longer supports Judeo-Christian morality. Can I move to the schools? Thank you, one hand clap, thank you. I don't think I have to make much, take much time talking about the frailties of our American school. The schools used to support the same morality that was taught in the family. So the same standards of right and wrong would be reinforced once you got to school. But with the secularization of America, the removal of prayer from our schools, the increasingly co uh, confused goals of American education, the schools no longer teach or support that morality that flows from the founding documents or that was once supported and taught in our family. With the rise of school shooting, the emphasis has moved from education to safety. And we can't even ensure that. We have young people leading a charge to make our schools safe while those in Congress and the halls of, of justice can't figure out what to do. How can you become educated if you're scared to go to school? 
Can I move on to the community? I'm going to be brief today because it's celebration day. I got to leave a lot of time for shouting. The community taught and reinforced the values and the morality that undergirded the founding documents and was taught and supported by the family and the school. But the community no longer teaches and supports the morality of the family or the school. Can I use sports for an example? Little League sports used to reinforce the values and morality that was taught and supported by family and schools. Is anybody hearing me? If you follow this, you will see something was taught at home that was reinforced at school that when you got to Little League was reinforced again. The Little League coaches, whether we're discussing baseball, football, or some other sport, would uh, be teaching the values of hard work, playing by the rules, fair play, all those kind of things. But today, the ultimate value that seems to be taught is win at any cost. Winning is more important now than how you play the game. It doesn't matter how you play as long as you win. And we don't remember losers. We only remember winners. So I got problems because the Little League is now in competition with Wednesday nights and Sunday morning worship times. Forty years ago, that would not be a problem, but today it is. And now we're having discussions with millennials and mosaics, and they didn't do it. They're just doing what they do. But we, the church, have to figure out how to respond to the fact. And I was in a discussion not too long ago that were saying, well, we just got to get with the time. Just change the church time and move on. Won't be no problem. Well, that's a solution, and I'm not, I'm not opposed to the solution. The problem is if we change everything and move everything according to current standards and what everybody wants right now, we'll end up losing the whole thing and what it's all about. There are some times that ought to be sacred and ought to be set apart so that no one and, no, and nothing can touch them. But we don't have any sacred time. We don't have any sacred things anymore. I don't know when that started, but it seemed like it started to me. One of those times was in living color. They started making fun of everybody and everything. Nothing was off limits. And so those three institutions, the family, the schools, and the community, are no longer teaching or supporting the Judeo-Christian morality that is connected to the dream of the founding document. People are, don't understand in America, we are crying about what's going on in Washington, D.C., but don't understand that in the populace, people are not supporting the morality that used to be, that was undergirding everything that was going on. So what we see now is chaos. But it's not just chaos in Washington, D.C. It's chaos across America. Because we don't know what's right and wrong anymore. Well, what about the church? I believe the secularization of the church is equal to that of the family, the schools, and the community. Instead of teaching and supporting kingdom-based morality, we have capitulated to the pressures of the supporting culture and are trying to accommodate the world rather than stand as a countercultural expression of the kingdom of God. Now, we want to do what the world does, and because we want to put, excuse my French, uh, butts in the seat, we'll do anything we got to do in order to get people to come to church. Y'all not going to like me today, are you? We just got to get you here. If we got to sell popcorn or have bingo or whatever we got to do to get you here, we need to get you here because the gospel won't get you here anymore. And so we ended up, we end up looking just like the world using secular methods and secular ways to try to bring people to church. And if you do that in the final analysis, you'll end up uh, bringing about and creating what the world creates. If you use their methods, you'll, you'll create what they're creating. You know what they're creating? Consumers, not worshipers. So therefore, people now come to church and pick church, not on the basis that God sent me to the church, but what kind of choir do they have? Do they have a gym? What, what, what kind of children's ministry do they have? Uh, do they have? And we're going to pick it on the basis of services that are passed out to me rather than God calling me. Did God call you for me, for me to serve you or for you to serve him? Touch your neighbor and say, I'm so glad when, he's, when he get done, I'll be...
Yet, it is my contention that we need the church to preach and practice a kingdom-based morality. I'm not saying we don't need the family. I'm not saying we don't need schools. I'm not saying we don't need the community. But this is the 44th church anniversary, not the 44th community anniversary. So I'm talking about the church. We still need the church to preach and practice a kingdom-based morality. What's going on in America is a direct reflection of what's not going on in the church. Since there is no basis, no one to hold up the morality, then we don't have any grounding in which to set and to change what's going on. I contend that America still needs the church. There was a day when you couldn't come in our neighborhood and find people who, had, who didn't go to church. They, they may be the biggest drug dealer in town, but they go going to church, and their kids go going to church, even though everything else is messed up. Now you can come into our neighborhood and find people who have never darkened the door of a church. We've lost our perspective. We've lost our way. We say, why, why do we need the church? And why, why does the church need to continue to preach? First, we're commissioned to do so. And secondly, we are in a unique position to do so. With the family failing, the school slipping, the community collapsing, the church may be the last hope for America. America still needs the church. Let me preach a little bit. We are commissioned by Jesus the Christ to be salt, light, and love. Matthew 5, 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Let's look at the verse from the cultural perspective of the ancient Mediterranean culture in which it is written. If you read the verse closely, you would know that there's something wrong with it because when does salt ever lose its taste? Salt is salt, but the Arabic word here means oven, and it suggests that the Hebrew and the Aramaic, that the word might mean earth, and it might carry the additional meaning of oven. Specifically, the word describes an oven familiar in cultures, many cultures around the world. It's an earth oven, a clay oven. When we had the one opportunity we had to go to Hawaii, we saw one of those ovens in a luau in Hawaii. You say, why one opportunity? Because I ain't going back. I can't fly 11 and a half hours. I was about crazy on there. I need to get up off of here. Perhaps Jesus can be more correctly understood to say, you are like the salt in the earth oven, or you're like the salt in the hearth. The word hearth signifies the floor of a fireplace, especially as it extends into the room. However, knowing the Aramaic word might mean earth or dirt or oven still is not enough. One needs to know how such an oven works in the Mediterranean world. The fuel used in that oven is not wood, which is not plentiful in the ancient Israel, which begs the question whether Jesus was a carpenter. And the Bible doesn't say he was a carpenter. The word that is used is that he's an artisan. He probably worked in stone. Tell somebody, say, that's why I don't come to this church. They mess up Christmas and everything else. He's a carpenter. Everybody know he's a carpenter. There's not a, lot of, not a lot of wood in the Mediterranean area, but there was a lot of stone projects going on. So one of the things you need to know, the fuel that's used in this oven is not wood. It's not plentiful. But they used, or charcoal, it wasn't plentiful. But what was plentiful was camel and animal dung, of which there is a steady and abundant supply. One of the household duties of young women during that time, forgive me sisters, was to collect dung. Mold it into patties and prepare it for fuel by salting it and letting it dry out in the sun. So you can thank God that you were born now, not then. Because think how good would you have been at making dung patties. <laughs> at the base, <laughs> at the base of the oven itself, is a block of salt 
It's placed as a kind of catalyst for the dung patty fuel. Therefore, in virtually all salt passages in the New Testament, salt is presented in its function as an aid for making fire burn rather than seasoning or preventing something. A catalyst is what it is. And the dictionary says the catalyst is a chemical that accelerates a chemical reaction, a substance that increases the rate of chemical reaction without itself undergoing any change. In this case, salt acts as a chemical or a substance that accelerates a reaction of fire in the oven. Armed with that understanding, let's go back to the text. You are the catalyst in the earth oven. But if the catalyst has lost its catalytic ability, how shall it be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trodden underfoot by human beings. Now, I got a lot more to talk about in terms of salt, but this is a celebration, so I can't do it. So let me jump. To the application when Jesus says to them you are the salt of the earth he's saying are you the salt of the earth you or, or the hearth you are the catalyst that caused fire to burn in the oven of the culture and the community you are the stimulus to change somebody or something that makes a change happen or brings about an event Jesus is saying those who are followers of mine are a stimulus to change you are a catalyst that brings about events what change is he talking about he was calling for change with respect to how the existing system of religion was carried out change with respect to the substance that would bring about fire in the temple religion he was talking about change that would bring about the coming kingdom of God as opposed to the Judean temple economy they were to start a fire of change that would burn in conflict until the kingdom replaced legalistic temple economy and they were to do so without having any change themselves I don't think y'all understand what I'm talking about. When you are a change agent, when God uses you as the thing that brings about change, you cause trouble every place you go with everybody you interact with. People don't like you. People don't understand you. The closest folks around you may not understand you because you're doing change. You didn't come to make everybody like you. You came to do change. And change starts fires in every place you go. Every place you walk in, something gets stirred up. Fire starts happening. Changes start going on. People get mad. They wonder what you're doing. I don't understand. It's called change. Jesus was an active, nonviolent resistor to the stuff that was going on around him. A change agent. I know you view him as a peasant that didn't do anything but walk around and be peaceful. No, Jesus was always in some mess. He was in mess with women because they were, he was always touching them and interacting with them. He was in mess with children. Why? Because they were trying to bring children to him and he's trying to stop them. No, don't bring them children. He said, suffer little children to come unto me. He was in mess with the temple economy where they were saying, you got to come to the temple. He said, you don't have to do that. You can walk this way. He was in, in mess with everything that's going on. When you are a change agent, you are a mess agent. And you're going to have to ask yourself a question. Are you willing to do that? Because it's going to be painful. And in some places you're going to have to walk alone. I'm just looking. I'm just trying to see who's in here. Is there really there or not? Are you the salt? Are we the salt of the earth? Are we the catalyst in our spheres of influence that cause fires of conflict that changes everything with respect to the kingdom? The church ain't causing no conflict now. We are responding after everything is over. You look at what's going on in Washington, D.C. right now. Where's the church? Do your lives make change happen in the direction of the kingdom? Do your lives bring about the kingdom of God? Are we fire starters for morality? Remember the movie Fire Starters? How fire was shooting out of her. 
on all kinds of ways to all kinds of things. We are fire starters who are prone to ignite conflict on purpose and inadvertently towards establishing the messianic kingdom of God or where, where Jesus shall reign from the throne of David. Now, you need to understand something. That sometimes and oftentimes we start this conflict without trying. We don't have to try to start it. It's who you are. You're a fire starter, and it does it. But sometimes we even start them on purpose. If you are one of those who like to start them on purpose, make sure you stay around long enough to put it out. Don't start some fire and walk away and leave everything burning. Our idea is to see a change come about. Have we lost, though, our catalytic ability, and are we acting like the world? Do we just want peace and to sit on the sideline and see nothing happen? We are the salt of the earth. Number two, we are the light of the world. Matthew 5, 14 through 15, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Jesus encouraged his followers, followers by pointing them to them that they are the light of the world. He further explains that no one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. In John 8 and 12, Jesus identifies himself to the religious powers of the day as the light of the world. He was the moral, spiritual, intellectual light of the world. He came to penetrate the darkness of evil, the darkness of this world. His followers, following his footsteps, are to be the moral, spiritual, intellectual light of the world. We are the spiritual light of the world. We ought to be the intellectual light of the world. We ought to be the moral light of the world. And the morality of the kingdom of God is to be shined in this world to light all the house of the world. The problem we have in America today is that there is no morality and there's no place to look for the morality. There's nobody teaching morality. There's nobody standing for morality. And yet we keep asking America, what is America going to do? Morality must undergird that. We must have some idea about what's right and what's wrong. What's good and what's evil. What ought to be done and what not ought to be done. Oh, I wish I had a celebration message. I'm trying to tell you why America still needs the church. I'm trying to tell you why it's still important and why the devil's still doing every he, everything he can to stop the church, to undermine the church, to destroy the church, to hold it back, to steal its influence, to, to, to take away from its, uh, its power and its effect. He's doing everything he possibly can. And sometimes we just don't seem to get it that this is a spiritual warfare. What kind of warfare did I say it was? It's a spiritual warfare, and the devil will use anything, anybody, whatever, to undermine and to destroy what God's trying to do. Finally, you can come back next Sunday. I'm preaching quick today. We are to teach and practice the powerful oxymoronic morality of love. John 3, 16, that you know so well, but can't seem to live out. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Love is a moral power that empowers us through the Holy Ghost to sacrificially give for the well-being of others. Love is a moral power that empowers us through the Holy Ghost to sacrificially give for the well-being of others. Love is a moral power. I'm just waiting until you hear me. That empowers us through the Holy Ghost to sacrificially give for the well-being of others. Now, you're thinking money right now. I'm not talking money. 
Be, it may include money. It be your time, your talents, your treasure. It includes everything about you, what you believe in, what you stand for. You are giving something sacrificially for the well-being of other people, for their salvation, for their deliverance, for them, for them to be blessed, for them to be able to move as God would want them to move. You are willing to give sacrificially beyond anything that you could imagine because you love. Love is the power that pushes us towards these things. What does the world need now? Oh, that's a song, isn't it? What the world needs now is love. Sweet love. The problem that's going on in the world is that we don't love other people. We probably don't even love ourselves anymore. And so it is hard to find the morality, the love moral morality that will push us towards where we need to go through the power of the Holy Ghost. Love is the moral power that empowers us through the Holy Ghost to sacrificially give for the well-being of others. John 13, 35, by this all men that know you will know you are my disciples if you have love for Love is the touchstone. It's the true measure of Christian discipleship and Christianity. There is one supreme way that we demonstrate that we are disciples of Jesus, and that is what we love one another. You don't demonstrate you're a Christian by being more, being a, a, a of artificially, outwardly, ostentatiously moral. You don't demonstrate that you are a Christian by giving money in church. You don't demonstrate you are a Christian simply because you are in a ministry. You don't demonstrate that you are a Christian in those ways. The ultimate demonstration of your Christianity is that you love one another. Now, when you love one another, there's some folks that, that'll, that'll cross in your sphere that'll come into your uh, thing that you might not want to love. I think I better look at the choir a little bit. That you might have difficulty loving. That you might think you ought not to be required to love. Because you ought to think it's beyond the pale, beyond my duty to go that far to love them. But love in Jesus' perspective, particularly from God the Father, he's an indiscriminate lover. He loves everybody he runs into. He loves indiscriminately. Now, not us. We love according to, you know, whether you fit my paradigm likes druthers. Whether you do what I think you ought to do, whether you want. But there are a lot of people that we have to deal with, like God has to deal with us, that I have to love that I might not even like. God loves you. And you got issues. Your attitude's not right. You stay angry and tore up half the time, but God still loves you. You're not doing what he ought to do, what he, what he wants you to do, but God still loves you. You failed over and over again, but God still loves you. Then we in turn ought to turn around and demonstrate his love by loving one another. Y'all, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I think y'all lost. Let me go back. Why does America still need the church? That's what I was talking about. And it's because we are commissioned to do, what, to do what we're talking about, and we are in a unique position. We are salt and light. That's the only two we've ever been taught. Now I'm talking about the third one. I'm not getting a lot of amens. And love. There's a lot of folks going out trying to be moral without any love. Trying to be the light without any love. That's the reason why the LGBT plus battle that's going on right now is so messed up. It's because when we start talking about LGBT plus issues, we do it nastily. I'm not talking about what we believe. I'm talking about how we act. Therefore, it's tough for me to, to, have what, to take what you have to say when you're acting that way without love. And yet, we ain't that nasty about adulterers. All right.
right, I, I shouldn't have said that. Love is the touchstone. It's the measure of whether we are, of what it looks like to be true Christians of Jesus Christ. Love is the only morality that exhorts us to love our enemies and to pray. So let me give you Matthew 5, 44. But I say to you, I don't even know why I'm going to read this, but I'm just going to do it because God called me to. I'm going to get on out the way. But I say to you, love your enemies. You can holler for the rest of them because they're not going to holler. And pray for those who persecute you. And he's not talking about imprecatory prayers. Anybody know what imprecatory prayers are? Those are the prayers David used to pray over his enemies. He said, Lord, I want you to destroy my enemies. I want you to, he's praying now. Love your enemies. Pray for those that persecute you. Tell me what can make you love your enemies except the love of God. Love, first of all, is the only morality that would even exhort you to love your enemy. And pray for those who persecute you. Love is the morality, uh, ultimate morality, because God in his personality and demonstration is love. I am firmly convinced, I am firmly convinced that we still don't even understand what love is or what it's calling us to do, what the call is to us. We are cut, cut you off in a minute and let you know that I think I done done all that God requires right now. I done gone as far as I'm gonna go with that. Is how far did God go with you? How far is he going with you right now? How far is he interacting with you right now, even where you are? How far? Where does the love of God end? I firmly believe, and I can't teach it today, I don't have enough time, that God loves and he never gives up loving. That's just me. You see it in the prodigal son. Even though the prodigal son is spit in his face and said, I wish you was dead. Give me what belongs to me today. He's sitting waiting for him to come back. And when he starts to come back, he sees him from a long way off. He's looking. He's waiting. Love is the ethic. Love is the morality of the kingdom of God. Love is the morality that still needs to be taught and supported in America. Love is the thing that would change the church. Love is the thing that would change America. Love is the thing that would change the world. Why are we messed up? Because America don't love nobody but itself. Why are we messed up? Because Russia loves itself. Why are we messed up? Because people in the church. Why are we messed up? Because love is not the motivating factor. It's not the essence. It's not that which is driving us. It's not that which is the power that takes us where we ought to go. Now, I'm going to stand here with you, so I want you to say, I don't want you to, I don't want you to walk away today and say, ooh, he preached so hard. Ooh, that, that was tough. I'm talking to me, too. I'm a part of the church. I'm a part of this, and there are areas in my life where my love will be tested. I ain't getting no amens on that. Everybody is going to be tested. And everybody's going to be called to love at a point that's going to be the most difficult point in your life. And that without the power of the Holy Ghost, you would never be able to cross over into. You would walk away and be messed up. But if you look back over your life, we look back over 44 years and see how many times God has delivered you, how many times God has spared you, how many times God has come and rescued you. Then, it ought to motivate you to want to help somebody else. I want to think about just a moment and I'll get out the way. The servant was messed up. He owed his master a, 
amount of money that when you look at it in the Greek, it's so much you can't even calculate it. He owed him about, can I, can I put it in modern terms? 30 gazillion bazillion dollars. You can't calculate it. And his master says, you're forgiven. Oh! Excuse me, because I just felt myself right there. You're forgiven. I don't care what the debt is. I don't care how much the debt is. I don't care how deep it is. You are forgiven. Are there any forgiven people in the house? Where are y'all at? I, I, you're forgiven. No matter what happened, no matter what went on, no matter what, what people said about you, no matter how they thought about you, no matter how they talked about you, you're forgiven. And you're glad about it. You're forgiven. And you don't mind shouting about it. Because God has given you something nobody else can give you. Glory. I'm forgiven. Every time I say that, I want to shout because I'm forgiven. Yes, I made some mistakes in the past. Yes, I've done some stupid stuff. Yes, I've sinned on occasion, but I'm forgiven. Glory. 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 Everything that I've ever done, past, present, and future, is forgiven in the blood of Jesus Christ. No wonder the songwriter said, when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah. I thank God for saving me. When I look back over 44 years, I got to say to stand here today is the power of a miracle. I don't stand here because I'm sinless. I don't stand here because I haven't made any mistakes. I stand here because of the forgiveness of God Almighty. Because I'm forgiven, I stand on the healing and cleansing and forgiving power of Jesus Christ. Yes! Hallelujah! Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. I got to make a point and I'm done, but I'm trying to get to the point. And to get to the point, I got to first play this right so that you can get with the, the contrast of what's going on. You probably don't understand some of you because I recognize that you shout more for basketball or football than you do for Jesus. But see, my greatest praise is reserved for God Almighty. My greatest praise is reserved for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. My greatest praise is reserved for him who got me out of darkness and brought me into the marvelous light. My greatest praise. Okay, that's the contrast. Now let's get, let's get the other contrasting point of view. You've shouted. We've heard about the servant. He turns around. And his neighbor owes him $34.63. <laughs> and he turns to him and says, you're going to pay me my money. <laughs> and he grabs him by the throat and he begins to choke him. Because you're going to pay me my money. Now he's not recognizing, he just got let off a billion, gazillion, trillion dollars. And he turns and takes it out on his neighbor. You go read the text. I, can't, I don't have much more time. You go read the text. Somebody went and told on him. I'm telling on y'all. I'm going to go to the father and say, look, I treated them this way. I treated them that way. They turned on me and said, give me my 36 cents. I want my money and I want it today. Go to the bank right now and get it. While they had been forgiven. Love ought to motivate us to give back what's been given to us. Love ought to motivate us to turn around and say, look, 
where he brought me from. Brought me out of darkness into this marvelous light. Now in turn, I'm going to go and help somebody else. I'm going to pass it forward. I'm going to reach back. I'm going to get somebody and bring them forward. I'm going to help somebody because I've been helped. I'm out of prison. I'm going to go get somebody else and bring them out of prison. Come on, somebody. Say hallelujah. So, America still needs the church. Because the church has the Christ-issued commission and is still in a unique position to continue to preach and practice a kingdom morality that is the necessary context to this ongoing experiment that we call America. Now is the day of salvation. Come to Jesus now. If you'd bow your heads and close your eyes, I'd like you to know this Jesus who died on Calvary. I'd like you to know him because he can broker a deal for you with the Father. And you can come into wonderful fellowship and relationship with God the Father. It's so simple and yet so powerful. All you need to do is say, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for every sin that I've sinned against you. Come in my life, save me. Make me the person you want me to be. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for the gift of eternal life. These are altar workers that are standing here. All they want to do is pray with you to make sure you know what it means when you trust Jesus to be saved. And if you want to make it public, they, want, they are willing, they want to pray with you. If you need a church home, they want to pray with you. The rest of us ought to thank God that we're forgiven, that we are salt, that we are light, that we are love. And it's a season for you to be blessed. After 44 years, it's time for you to stop being messed up and start being blessed.